Star Wars droids. Won't be seen tonight, so we can bring you a very special episode of The Gen X Files. Welcome to The Gen X Files. I'm Jim. I'm Adam. And today's show is all about Last Last Action Action Hero. Hero. Like a baby bubby bunkers. Robber baby buggy bumpers. <laughs> I think of all the movies we're covering this month, uh, this is by far my favorite. Yeah. Uh, this one actually is a movie, yes. not just a conglomeration of bad decisions. This is like our Mars Attacks of this month. Yeah. It's a, it's a way better movie than people gave it credit for when it first came out. Definitely, and it's a <laughs> way better movie than Hudson Hawk oh, God. or Howard T. Duck. Or Howard the Duck. Yeah, either. I, both of those were just lots of bad decisions piled on top of each other. And this one, actually, it, I think it proves that Arnie was uh, is a good businessman mm-hmm. and makes good decisions. And uh, that the studio does not. The studio, unfortunately, is stupid. Yes. <laughs> That's the one thing you take away from this month. Studio is bad. I'll also say, because it's been a while since I've seen this film, mm-hmm. and uh, I think now it's even more prescient because it really is a time capsule of these over-the-top action movies. Oh, and yeah. yeah. It really is a great send-up of these ridiculous yeah. movies that just kept, kept getting more and more over-the-top and ridiculous. Right. And more body right. counts and more blood and more... <laughs> but, you know, what's kind of funny is... You watch these movies today, and they're kind of quaint. I mean, the violence is violent, but it's not... But not like it is now. Yeah, it's not like the boys or... (laughs) No, no, there's not the gore in... Like, horrible gore. Although, this movie was PG-13, so, I mean, that was all going to be toned down regardless. Right, but, but, I mean, they they really pushed the envelope. Oh, they did. Oh, no, they definitely did. They definitely did. I think one of the... One of the problems with this film, like, the real problems, not the fake problems, is that... It kind of, I'm not saying it didn't know what it was. It knew exactly what it was. Yeah, yeah. But I think the having the kid in this situation, it kind of straddled adult and kid movie in a way that was like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? it, it definitely, yeah, it could have been more clear in that regard. Uh, I, I think, to, to piggyback on that, I think a lot of the issue was that this really was the kid's movie. Yeah. And they marketed it as a Schwarzenegger yeah. movie, which it's, I mean, it is kind of, but it's not. And right. like, I think that's where it could have been clarified a bit more. Also, I think they could have maybe gone for R if the kid was like 13 or 14. You know, yeah. If it was like I a, mean, a he was supposed teenager. to be nine or ten. Yeah, it's like yeah, you can't go that direction. I mean, there's a lot of traumatizing. <laughs> even if it is a movie, and you're inside a movie, there's a lot of traumatizing things happening. I mean, there is. It gets, it gets dark, yeah. man. It gets dark, well, especially with Tom Doonan. Oh, God, he's character. so creepy. He's so creepy. The best is when he shows he shows up as the the fictional character, the Ripper, and then he shows up as himself, and he looks so much more normal. And it's just like, oh, Tom, hey, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> what are you, what, what, yeah. yeah, Tom Noonan is just he's, the ass. He's he fantastic. So yeah, um, yeah, but it was it it is so much better than people thought it was, and it was yeah. ahead of its time. I yeah. think a bit. And yeah, and it's and it's definitely gained a bigger cult following since then. Well, also like, well, also how do you? parody something that is it's like parodying donald trump right yeah it's like the ori- the original thing yeah. is so over the top and ridiculous that yeah, you have to be you... super over the top right, and ridiculous right. what do you do yeah to you know to make your point yeah. and i think they did and they did it in a very clever way you know Al- but, although it i will say that they're over the top in last action hero still was nothing like harley davis the marble man oh definitely you know? yeah. i mean like it's like it still didn't quite go as far i still think that this movie's great yeah. and i think that it is is very i think it gets the point across very well sure what it's trying to do uh but yeah it's it's hard to make fun of something that has already made fun of it, making fun of itself so much. Right, or has gone into, you know, once we started gearing into the last action, or not last action year, that's what we were covering today. When we started uh, gearing in towards the last Boy Scout, is that what it is? Yeah, called? yeah. You know, and we, the, the, the tail end of Shane Black's first career yeah, before yeah. his renaissance with it was bang, bang. it was the movie he did just before this, right? Which he must have just been in a horrible place because <laughs> it was, it's the most it's really I mean, awful it's movie, just the most bleak film ever. But I, you know, it's it's in that movie you have a guy in an NFL game 
Yeah. With a been, ball uh, running and shooting people. Yeah. Any, yeah. you know. How do you how do you make fun of that? How exactly. do you how do you go further <laughs> than that and make it funny? So yeah. stupid. So stupid, so but stupid. they they did a great job trying. And, oh yeah. Oh, and yeah. again, if you haven't seen this movie in a long time or if you haven't seen this movie and stayed away because of whatever the press yeah, you know, yeah. don't listen. This movie's great. Let's yeah, get into really it. Fun. All right, take yourself back to 1993. Yeah, uh, April to October, it's the Great Flood of 1993. Uh, the Mississippi and Missouri rivers flood large portions of the American Midwest. Oof. Uh, I did not have running water for 13 days because the river uh, in Des Moines went over, and literally, they decided the best place to build the water purification like plant was on the banks of the river. <laughs> so all smart. the river water just went in. There was no clean water for like 13 days. No, we didn't have water. We actually had to go up to, um, they had a giant, like, uh, the National Guard came in. They had like a giant, like, 5,000 gallon, like, water blimp thing. Oh, wow. Um, but every time we had to go up and get like five gallon buckets and like take it up there to like flush toilets. And plus it was raining constantly. So, like, we literally just went outside and then washed our hair and shit. Weird. Um, it was it was weird. It was very weird. All almost all of the Midwest was flooded for like three months. It was bad. Biblical. Yeah. Uh, April nineteenth, the Waco siege, a fifty one day standoff at the Branch Davidian compound near Waco, Texas, ends with a fire that kills seventy six people, including David Koresh. This incident and the Ruby Ridge incident, uh, those are the the real beginnings of this ridiculous like QAnon stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And all this huge conspiracy. Look, uh, yeah, the conspiracy stuff started with JFK and that kind of thing. But this was the yeah, yeah. deep state government. Yeah, be- this this and Ruby Ridge were the yeah. two that it was like, oh, they just want to try to kill all of us. Because they were so, they were just horribly bungled. Yeah. They yeah. were bungled. It was not handled well. No. Well. no. It, it's it's bad police work and uh, yeah, just a horrible, horrible yeah, situation. The whole the whole Waco thing was just awful. Uh, it ended badly, and a bunch of people died, and they didn't need to. Yeah, uh, it was just sad. Yeah, and I mean, it's not just the FBI's fault, of course. It's no, also no, David I mean, Koresh David and, Koresh was yeah. crazy. I, but yes, he. Th- there was no reason for them to be there. They were. They weren't. I, and I'm not sympathizing with David Koresh, but like you know, most of them were just peace loving people that just wanted to be left alone. And they exacerbated the situation by feeding into the narrative of yeah. the cult. Yeah. And you know. Yeah. It just wasn't smart. No, it wasn't it smart. Was not. Ruby Ridge wasn't smart. Hopefully, the ATF learned their lesson. I hope so. April 30th, tennis player Monica Sellis, at this time the top-ranked player in women's tennis, is stabbed during a match at the 1993 Citizen Cup in Hamburg, Germany. God, that was crazy. Do you remember that? Yes. It was so insane. And she was the one that was like, ah! <laughs> oh, yeah. She, yeah. she was the super loud she was hitter. Loud. And, then, and then everybody, this is what was so effed up about the 90s. Yeah. Because when it happened, she was like, oh, my God, why? Or whatever. You know, she was yeah. stabbed. Yeah. And then yeah. people were making fun of her reaction of, of it because of human beings are disgusting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, June 18th, Last Action Hero is released in theaters. Danny. Yeah. Danny, where are you, Danny? <laughs> God, he yells Danny. Danny and Jack. This is the two most used words this entire script. Jack. Danny. Danny. Danny, you need to jump to me, Danny. Danny, trust me, Danny. Yeah. Jump into my arms. Uh, get into my belly. Oh, but he's so good. Aren't he so good, though? He's so good. He is. Like, he is. He, there were some... I feel like he had a lot on his plate on this one. Yeah, he did. And uh, and I think he did. Mostly did a really good job. There was a couple of whatevers, but he was working really hard on this one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it... It worked. I the character arc that he had upon realization that he was not a real person mm-hmm. was fantastic. It was great, and him playing him and making fun of himself. Yeah, his wife being like, "Please his, don't embarrass me. Don't talk, like, Please don't talk about the restaurants. Talk about the restaurants on the way of this planet Hollywood. The menu, and oh, oh, I guess I'm being taken away. <laughs> it was great. It was really it. It was fun watching this movie. Like, yeah, uh, I, I. <laughs> we had some fun watching Howard T. Duck. We had very little fun uh, watching Hudson Hawk. And I'm really glad this is the last one because we kind of saved the treat for last. Yeah, yeah. It's good. It's it's just, it's an it's undeserved super, bomb. It's super fun. I yeah. agree. I agree. This one, look, the first one was the the fault of the director and the writers, yeah, Howard yeah, the Duck. Yeah. Hudson Hawk, it's the fault of the star, Bruce Willis. And this one is definitely the fault of the executives. The yes. creatives did their job. They did. They did. They they worked real hard. And then the studio effed them. Yeah. And and I'll give my 
Yeah. You know, it's no no secret what my uh, hypothesis is, but we'll talk about sure. it later. Sure. Uh, the original screenplay was developed by Adam Leff and Zach Penn with Arnold Schwarzenegger in mind for the lead and was titled Extremely Violent. Funny. Yeah. Uh, Leff and Penn would write PCU together, which was released in 1994 uh, after this. Yeah, I, Jeremy Piven. I, guilty pleasure for me. I, it, was on, it was one of those that was on TV all the time. Oh, yeah. All the time. It wasn't... F- what was oh it was John uh, George Fav- Clinton John the, Favreau wasn't it yeah and, he was the uh, George Clinton, Clinton. Clinton yeah John Favreau with his white dreads <laughs> what's really funny is when that movie came out I was working at the Mondrian and George Clinton lived there with oh his wife. wow really and we had a standing order at the bar to never serve Clinton's wife oh really and if she came down to the bar to make a call because she was out of control oh oh, oh wow 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 allegedly. Although I did experience it, so it was. <laughs> uh, the last time they worked together, uh, Leff and Penn, was in 1994 on Incident at Loch Ness, with Leff getting a story credit and Penn co-writing with Werner Herzog while making his directing debut. Werner Herzog? Uh, the Werner Herzog. He wrote it with Werner Herzog, yeah. I thought he had directed stuff before then. No, not Werner Herzog. Zach Penn. Oh! <laughs> okay, it makes a lot more sense. And it was in 1984. I, that is incorrect. I believe it was like 2004. Uh, I something going on at Loch Ness. Uh, I just, I've never seen this. I've heard of this movie. I've never seen it. It's really funny. It's I, kind of a, you know, yeah. like a takeoff on his uh, documentary stuff. Right, right. Well, that makes sense. Uh, Penn would gain a much higher profile uh, writing Inspector Gadget in 1999. Inspector oh, Gadget. Who played movie. Inspector? Oh, that was, that was uh, uh, Matthew Broderick. Matthew Broderick, yeah. I always get that mixed up with Get Smart. Oh, it was not a good movie. Uh, Behind Enemy Lines in 2001. That was pretty good. Uh, which is not a bad movie. Yeah. Uh, and X-Men The Last Stand in 2006. Yes, the third movie that is horribly atrocious. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Penn would go on to write The Incredible Hulk in 2008, which a lot of people consider to be the first MCU movie, uh, plus the story for the first Avengers movie, and Ready Player One in 2018, and Free Guy in 2021. All right, all decent. I mean, nothing spectacular, but Eh, nothing horrible. I wasn't a huge fan of Ready Player One. Uh, The Avengers and The Incredible Hulk were fine, and Free Guy was actually really fun. I think the Hulk, this is the Ang Lee Hulk? No. Uh, This is the one after. Oh. Uh, I thought the Ang Lee Hulk was kind of underrated. It was okay. I... I'm not a big fan of Eric being in a... Yeah. I, Ang Lee is so hit and miss for me. Yeah. Like, I, I... It just... It felt more like an Ang Lee movie than an Incredible Hulk movie. Sure, but I... You know, I think that was the point. Yeah. It just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll have to rewatch it. We'll do a Hulk month, and we'll do the yeah. series and all the movies. <laughs> uh, after Columbia purchased the script, the studio independently approached Arnold about the movie... Arnold's decision came down to either the now-titled Last Action Hero or a Penny Marshall-directed Columbia comedy called Sweet Tooth. Oh, I'm really looking forward to Sweet Tooth. I play the Tooth Fairy. <laughs> uh, that's probably true. I don't uh, a very big Tooth Fairy. Uh, Arnie actually chose the Last Action Hero, be- saying it was one of the best scripts he'd ever read. Nice. Uh, he also was given his first chance to executive produce a movie, and was excited to be involved in every aspect of the production. I'm very excited to be involved in every aspect of the production. I mean, he kind of was anyway, but like this was giving him the title and giving him the authority yeah. to be like, you can make the decisions. Uh, no more marshmallows at craft service. Uh, I'm, guessing, make you flabby. I'm guessing the $15 million paycheck he got probably didn't hurt either. Uh, <laughs> it helped. Uh, the original script was meant to parody typical action film screenplays of writers such as Shane Black, who had written Lethal Weapon, Lethal Weapon 2, and The Last Boy Scout. Uh, he'd also done uncredited rewrites on Predator, Dead Heat, and The Hunt for Red October. Nice. Uh, he he was almost as wanted for his rewrites as he was for his original scripts. Yeah. Well, he's a great writer. Yeah. I mean, at the yeah. time, he was also the action Yeah. He had kind of created the... Not created, but he had shepherded in the modern uh, yeah. aspect of the The action. buddy cop movie. Uh, yeah. Lethal Weapon yeah. was the it was archetype. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, ironically, this, the script for Last Action Hero was actually later rewritten by Shane Black and frequent collab- collaborator David Arnott to rev up the action sequences. Oh, and they did. Uh, Carrie Fisher and Larry Ferguson did uncredited rewrites on the script. Uh, Fisher did script doctoring on Hook and Sister Act. She was one of the most sought-after yes. script doctors in Hollywood. Huge. Very, very quiet about her oh. script doctoring, but man... Not- De- like this, her not taking credit on this yeah. was kind of de rigor for her. She, yeah, she yeah. was like, "Let's bring in Fisher; she'll save it for oh, us." She was, she was amazing. A brilliant writer. Yeah, Ferguson had written Highlander. Ah, uh, you have a movie for a watch too. 
put four headings on two sword for fun. Uh, and Beverly Hills Cop 2, The Hunt for Red October, and Alien 3 All right. are like part of Alien 3, because it technically was a mishmash of sure. mini scripts. I liked Alien 3. I know, I don't I didn't I don't mind it either. Uh, William Goldman then did a $1 million polish on the script when Arnold made it clear he would not begin filming until Goldman added depth to the characters. Oh, then it will be depth to the characters, and the only one who can do it is William Goldman. Uh, he was a huge fan of Goldman, who had won two Academy Awards, uh, one for original screenplay in 1969 for Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, and one for adapted screenplay in 1976 for All the President's Men. Two classics. Two absolutely Amazing perfect classics. movies. Uh, it's brilliant. Uh, Steven Spielberg almost directed Last Action Hero, but he chose to make Schindler's List instead. Couldn't be <laughs> more different. It was a send-up of all the Nazi movies. And <laughs> it was, I can just imagine him being like, I know he had been talking about wanting to make Schindler's List for like years. Well, sure. So he finally got the opportunity, but a Last Action Hero Steven Spielberg would be very odd. Yeah. <sighs> I don't know. I mean, it would probably be akin to like 1941, or you yeah, know. yeah. I mean, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be bad, but it would just be interesting. I think it would have been really good because, you know, as the is, you know, pretty much the father of the Hollywood blockbuster, yeah, yeah. the modern day Hollywood it would blockbuster. Have, yeah, it would have made sense. It would have been great, and it would have, it really would have changed the trajectory of his career because Schindler's yeah. List took him in such a different direction. Yeah, yeah. That, you know, if he would have done this, who knows uh, if he yeah. would have ever. We never would have had the Fablemans. Yeah. <laughs> I never saw it. I can't judge because I never saw it. I just know Seth Rogen made him cry. <laughs> so John McTiernan originally actually turned down the offer to direct the film. Uh, Robert Zemeckis was under consideration to direct, but then McTiernan changed his mind and then brought him on. I changed my mind. Yeah, I'd, I'm sure it's probably a contract dispute. Probably wanted more money. I'm just a grumpy guy. Uh, McTiernan's a big hit was in 1990 with The Hunt for October, two years after the insane blockbuster that was Die Hard. Uh, unfortunately, his next collaboration with Sean Connery after The Hunt for October in 1992, Medicine Man was a box office dud. I've lost the cure for cancer. Yeah. I don't honestly think I've ever seen Medicine Man. It is not good. Uh, Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that is the line. That is the big line from that movie. I've lost the cure for for cancer. Yeah, Yeah, he's this wild-haired, tree-living weirdo that uh, I think uh, Lorraine Bracco comes to. She's the one from. Lorraine Bracco? I think she's the one from uh, Sopranos, right? Yeah, Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Lorraine Bracco. I think she comes as like a something to visit him and then they fall in love or whatever it's just dumb it's it's the really dumb guy's version of mosquito coast that's what i always associate the two so (laughs) they're not even really close because no uh in mosquito coast he's not a scientist he's just kind of a right weirdo (laughs) he's just a weirdo uh, so Arnold Schwarzenegger was cast as Defe- Detective Jack Slater. Jack Slater! Uh, Schwarzenegger had a string of hits leading up to Last Action Hero. Uh, Twins in 1988 with Danny DeVito, directed by Ivan Reitman. Uh, you're my twin brother! Oh, uh, such a good movie. Uh, it actually made $260 million from an $18 million budget. It was a great movie. That's a hu- it's huge. The it's chemistry huge between oh, DeVito so and, and Arnold is, it, to this day, is still... Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. Perfect. I mean, they're great. T- you know, they're not awesome. I wish they would do another movie together. I know. I know. I would, too. Uh, Arnie, being the consummate businessman, made a deal with the studio that he, DeVito, and Reitman would take 40% of the box office and rental returns rather than a flat paycheck, giving them all the biggest paydays of the respective careers. This is why Arnold is a genius. Yeah. And I'm not even... That's not hyperbole. This guy no. is smart as F. You know, before he even started in Hollywood, he came to L.A. after the first earthquake in, like, 70... One or something? That sounds right. And uh, uh, please don't quote me. Uh, and he started a brick bu- building business oh, and yeah. became a millionaire. Oh, wow. While he was doing his bodybuilding stuff. Wow. The guy has always been a consummate yeah. businessman. He's, yeah, he's very intelligent that way. And he works his ass off. Oh, yeah. He, he, no one's going to accuse him of dragon ass. He is not lazy. <laughs> uh, Total Recall in 1990, the sci-fi actor that made over $260 million. Uh, listen to our episode 91, our Total Recall episode, for more on that. I have Total Recall. Yeah. Uh, Kindergarten Cop, also in 1990, which only made $91.5 million, still a relatively good profit margin from the, the budget, but more importantly gave Arnie his best reviews for his comedic timing. It's not a tumor. Yeah, it's he, not a tumor at all. It's the first movie where the reviewers were like, hey, actually, he can act. Like, this is pretty good. He was really good, and I think one of the things that was a, vi- a big strength of that movie 
and I'm sorry that I forget her name, but the actress that played his partner, the one that got sick and yes. couldn't be. Uh, yes. Such a great Man, actor. She is fantastic. Yeah, and she had such great chemistry with him. He, the thing about Arnold... Hey, me to The thing about Arnold that is fascinating is he surrounds him. He knows who makes him better. Yeah. And he yeah. lets them do it. Like, he's not... Yeah, yeah. He's a big ego guy. He's a big, I want to be the best, the biggest, the most successful. But when it comes to the work... I really think he doesn't showboat. No. You know? No. I think he... No. I, I think he's constantly learning. And, yes. like, I think he wants to be around actors that are make him better because right. he's constantly trying to make himself a better actor. I, I know this is going to sound crazy, but I don't think I could see him doing a Hudson Hawk. I don't think I could see no. him doing a Bruce Willis, oh, listen to me, I'm the yeah, star. Yeah, no, no. It, he always has the project in mind. Yeah. It's, always, it's always about what's best for the show and what's best, you know, because he knows at the end of the day, he can make money, he'll make the studio money, he'll make everybody working on the movie money. Yes, and he's just... One of my favorite stories about him, and this is really quick, and I think I've told it before, but Bill Hader was a PA for a lot of years. Mm -hmm. And he was a PA on, I think, Erasure. And Arnold comes in, and he's like, well, it's so-and-so. And 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 Bill Hader's like, I don't know. I'll I'll go find him. He's like, good. Show me your leadership capabilities. (laughs) And, and, And even though it's kind of like... He's giving that kid a shot. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. It's like he's giving him encouragement. He's a positive guy. Yeah, yeah. You know, with his presidential physical fitness. Yeah. He's, he's just always been a positive force. He wants everything to be better. and it's For everyone. And, and it's so it's so rare in Hollywood. Except for uh, for a long time, except for uh, Sylvester, Sylvester Stallone. Yeah. Because well, of their rivalry. Uh, yeah. But that was, it was also, a friendly rivalry. But also, yes, he knew. I mean, he knew that that would help boost both of them. The worst thing that happened because of that rivalry the worst, good lord, the worst thing that happened because of that rivalry was Stop or My Mom Will Shoot. Yes. Which, you know, <laughs> hey, it's somebody's favorite movie. Somebody out there really likes it. Nobody's getting shot over action movie beefs. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Uh, and then, of course, in 1991, he had Terminator 2 Judgment Day, which made an insane $520 million. Hasta la vista. Huge, huge movie. Baby. Baby, yeah. Uh, and oh, t- amazing. And it's such a great movie. I love T2 so much. I saw that on... Oh, it was, it was one of my favorite Fourth of Julys ever. It was in Boston. Uh, with I was with my girlfriend at the time, and we had a great lunch. And we went to see Terminator Two, which was amazing. And then we went to the Charles River and watched the Boston Pops on the half shell, oh, conducted wow. by John Williams. Oh wow! Wow, nice. Sounds like a fun day. It was a great day. Uh, in, peaked. in total, Arnie's last four movies made over $1 billion in box office. Which back then was a lot of money. Huge, yeah. I mean, I mean it's a lot of money over, today. Over four movies. That's, yeah. that's impressive. Look, I know today movies make a billion dollars on their own, but that's because ticket prices are three times as, yeah. as expensive. And it's got a much larger world market than it did yes. back yes. in the day. Much, much more distribution yes. than it used to be. I mean, China alone. Yeah. Is you know billions and billions. Oh yeah, millions yeah, and millions. Yeah. Of dollars. In total, over his career, Arnie has grossed more than four billion dollars at the box office. Uh, after the bomb of Last Action Hero, Arnie would rebound with a series of high-grossing movies, but with mostly negative reviews. Yeah. Uh, with True Lies in 1994 being an exception, which is a phenomenal movie. Very fun. Uh, he went to star in Junior in 1994, which I like and you don't. Uh, I haven't seen it in a long time. I remember not liking it. Uh, but again, it's DeVito and Schwarzenegger, so maybe I need to give another shot. Oh, DeVito is my lover and put a baby in my belly. Oh, God. Ah, take it. Take uh, it. He, in 1996, <laughs> he was in Eraser and Jingle All the Way. Ugh, Eraser was horrible. Jingle All the Way is fine. Eraser wasn't good, but it made a lot of money. Uh, I think that was about the time when people started to realize that his action movies are getting a little stale. I LM to the effects for Eraser, so oh, I was yeah. at that that office quite a bit oh yeah and on that set quite yeah. a bit it, mm. it wasn't a very happy place to be uh batman and robin in 1997 is mr freeze freeze uh, which is an, an exception because you know he was essentially a supporting character and it was just not good no and it wasn't his fault he was fine it was just bad it dialogue just, it was bad writing it was a bad movie it was bloated it was yeah. stupid that yeah. was the bat nips one right yeah with Clooney. And it was Clooney, and it was it was him constantly Every single line he had was just a one-liner. Yeah. Every single line. Oh. And it was so annoying. Oh, it's getting cold in here. <laughs> Let me put the cubes in your ice. 
<laughs> what? What are you talking about? Ah, uh, icicles. Okay. It's so All lazy. Right. What are you... <laughs> uh, end of days in 1999. The, the weird uh, d- religious one, kind of. Satan's babies in your belly. Satan thing. He's a know. cop. And, and uh, um... I remember not hating it. No, it's not horrible, but again, it was it was the time it was like erasure in these kind of like they were Schwarzenegger light movies where they yeah. weren't really good. They were a little the, the, too the plots were very thin. Yeah, and they were a little too serious. Yeah. And it didn't take advantage of the fun that he is. And this had uh Robin Tierney playing this young woman who I think was going to give birth to the Antichrist and it had this oh. it was this old devil thing. And, yeah, I and remember, he was this yeah. cop who's trying to stop it, they have to stop the devil. It was just, yeah, it was bad. It was, yeah. Uh, the Sixth Day in 2000, which was um, about cloning yeah. and was the beginning of the end. <laughs> yeah. uh, it was not a good movie at all. No. And then even worse was Collateral Damage in 2002. Uh, both of them barely made back their budgets. Was that the, when well, he was the fireman, the Collateral Damage uh, in, the, in the tunnel? There was no. like a terrorist attack. There was a terrorist attack, but it was down at LA Center Studios because I remember them using the bridge going over. Oh, I'm thinking of daylight. You're with, thinking of daylight. With, uh, well, still alone. Uh, who yeah. you watch yourself? It's uh, not him. It's me. No, collateral damage was like his his. I think his family dies or something. Yeah, but he was like a fireman. Yeah, thing. but he, he's trying to get it back. It was a terrorist anyway, attack. It was he, not good. Yeah. It was not good at all. Uh, in 2004, he technically retired from acting, and then he ran for governor of California, <laughs> which of course he won. Yeah. Which was the weirdest. That like, whole kind of a, thing was super weird because they were, they had to do a special election. recall mm-hmm. election for Gray Davis, and then Gray Davis got recalled, and then Governor won. Governor won. <laughs> Schwarzenegger won. It was just the whole thing was odd. So, and like Gary Coleman was running. Everybody was running. It was the weirdest uh, election yeah, too. All these fringe odd. candidates. There was like 120 people running. It was bad. I was a governor, and we all thought it was a joke. And then when he won, we were all super embarrassed. I mean, no offense, yeah. but it's like we didn't. He was want... he was fine as a governor. I mean, he he again. This goes to I think he still is trying. To help everyone. Yeah. Uh, he's one of the few last remaining conservatives that's actually trying to help everybody. Well, look, Arnie, he's a narcissist, let's be <laughs> honest. But he's at least one of the good ones. Yeah. Who yeah. who uses his his extreme ego and and, uh, and thoughts of his delusions of grandeur for yeah. good rather yeah. than well, evil. Well, he, I mean, he understands what he can do and where he, you know, what what his stature means and what his presence means. And, and he's, he's done a lot of good. He's done a lot of good oh my for God, people. Sure. Like it's, it's charity. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the guy is, a, he's a really good dude. It was just, he wasn't a great governor and you know, I, I just, I am against celebrities. Being no, I, I totally agree. With it that. never works out. I totally agree. It never works. It's out. not a good thing. Uh, mere weeks after leaving office in 2011, he resumed his acting career. He can most recently be seen in FUBAR, the TV series that's similar to True Lies. I saw, I think, a couple episodes. I, I need to watch it. I don't know if it's going to get renewed or not. They claim it hasn't technically been canceled, so there's probably going to be another season of it. I think there's a season two. There, there's been some interesting movies, too. There was that zombie movie he did. Yeah. Uh, I, I always want to call it Mandy, but that's a that's Nicolas not, Cage movie. Cage. But it's got that kind of name. Yeah, yeah. He's done some good stuff. Uh, he also did all the, or not all of them, but he did a couple of the Expendables movies, which he were, did. He did with Stallone, and yeah. But uh, it's, look, my favorite thing that he does now, and I think I've talked about this before, and I can't stop watching it. It's my most favorite thing. If I'm in a bad mood or if I feel sad, yeah, I'll watch videos of Arnold with his miniature donkey and his miniature horse. Yeah, yeah. and they just sit around the table while he's eating. He's like, "Ah, oh, those bites for me, and those bites for you, and there's a <laughs> cookie for you." And it's just the cutest thing in the world. Uh, he'll be seen playing the president in the upcoming Kung Fury 2, a part that he shot in actually 2019, but still hasn't been released yet due to legal issues. Kung Fury? Which one was that? Kung Fury originally came out in like 2015. It was um, st- it was just starring one guy, like the guy that I think that directed. It was it was like a sp- spoof movie. It wasn't animated. No, no, it was it was live action. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, it it it, 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 st- it was one of those. He started on U- like YouTube, and then he turned into a feature, and the feature was, I it, I remember it not being good. Okay. Uh, but anyway, Kung Fury Two apparently is coming out. It's got a huge amount of celebrities in it. It's just I think he did one of those things where he shot it over like four years. Right. Catch catch cam. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, Austin O'Brien was cast as Danny Madigan. Danny! Uh, Elijah Wood actually read for the part of Danny, but was deemed too young. Yeah, that would have been weird. He's just too much of a sweet little boy. Yeah, he was. He would have been very young. Very he, good, should, yeah. but just too, like, fragile. Yeah. Uh, the producers tried to get Macaulay Culkin in for Danny, as he was Arnie and McTiernan's favorite, but he was too busy shooting The Good Son and The Nutcracker. Would have been a distraction. I'm sorry. It, it just... Yeah. You needed a kid who was a kid. You needed a kid who you didn't know to counter the giant superstar. Yeah. If it was Culkin and and Arnold, it would have yeah. been like, you know, it would have been hard. Yeah, a different would... kind of movie. I agree. I don't. Uh, I don't. I think. I don't think Culkin. He, Culkin's great, but I don't think he he would have been more. He would have been funnier, but I don't think he would have been able to do the heart. Yes, I agree. And be as normal. Yeah, I agree. If I agree. that makes any yeah. sense. Uh, he'll, uh, ironically, Austin O'Brien would actually score a part in My Girl 2, opposite most of the original stars, replacing Macaulay Culkin since he... Spoiler alert! Spoiler alert! Uh, dies from bees in the first movie. Not the breeze! Yeah. Not the breeze! Uh, O'Brien originally gained fame from a Circuit City commercial as a kid, who, after finding out he had saved money, says... Cool! To the store's employee. I actually found this commercial on YouTube <laughs> and watched it. Was it cool? Um, yeah, it was funny, because it was like they are just promoting the fact that if you buy something and then it goes on sale later, you can come in and get the... the difference that is cool and so he goes in and he like he's like bought a walkman and he's like i just thought this but but this ad came out today and the guy looks at him he's like yeah and he's handsome cash and he's like cool yeah <laughs> uh i miss circuit city and the good guys yeah yeah i bought a lot of electronics there yeah i too mad so many electronic stores going away my favorite going thing away. Uh, whenever I would buy, like, whenever I, like, I was buying TVs all the time, Johnny TV <laughs> Every guy. other weekend. <laughs> but when I would do a big purchase, like a yeah. TV or something, I would go in and be like, all right, blah, 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 you know, knock off $200 or whatever. And then they'd be like, okay, we can deliver it Thursday. I was like, well, Best Buy says they could deliver it today, so I'm going to go there now. And they'd be like, <laughs> uh. And then the poor son of a bitch would have to do it himself <laughs> oh, because no. I was the a-hole that was. No. But you could play them against each other yeah. and get such great deals. Yeah. I missed those, like. Yeah. Those times of actually, I know. you know, bargaining and bartering and getting in there. Yeah. And this is just Amazon click, clack, clue. No, no, no bartering anymore. Oh. Uh, Austin O'Brien made his feature film debut in 1992 with The Lawnmower Man, starring Pierce Brosnan and Jeff Fahey, the Stephen King adaptation, in name only. It's so not at all. It's not. This, they actually started, I fell into a weird Lawnmower Man rabbit hole. They actually started developing that movie shortly after the short story came out in like 1975 oh, or wow. 76 because it was going to be based on the actual story. Yeah, yeah. Which is a satyr that eats his lawn. It was like four pages long and there was no plot. <laughs> so they ended, up, they ended up being like, well, we can't do anything. So they, they literally bought another book and then adapted that and then just called the lawnmower man. Yeah, because there's no guy getting higher intelligence, you no, know. No, no. Chris Brosnan was in Lawnmower Man. Yeah. He was the scientist. Yeah, he was the one that get, makes Jeff Fahey smart. Uh, come here, Jeff Fahey. Let's make you smart. I move lawnmowers, man. That's how you <laughs> I lawn lawnmowers, man. <laughs> so O'Brien <laughs> O'Brien would be the only actor from the original to appear in the sequel in 1996, The Lower The Lawnmower Man Beyond Cyberspace. Oh, it was so much better. It was such a good movie. It was not. It was uh the guy who took over for Jeff Fahey was uh oh tall tall long face. Oh, I don't remember his name. He was uh, a character actor that like he has a long face. He was in uh There we go. Why the long face? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was so much worse. It was so much worse than the worst movie. They're all... Uh, yeah. It was bad. Uh, in 1996, O'Brien would land a part in Promised Land, the TV spinoff from the highly su successful Touched by an Angel. Was he an angel? No. Oh. He was a part of a family. Uh, it starred Gerald McRaney as a man on a special mission, traveling around in his Airstream trailer with his family, helping and learning about people in the United States. So funny. I love Gerald McRaney. He was Simon and Simon, and then he was amazing in Deadwood. And oh, yeah. uh, he's his career now, he's doing some amazing work. But it's just so funny. If you've been around for as long as he has, I totally forgot about... There's like eight different shows well, that he then probably he, started didn't in. He do, didn't he do... Wasn't there a sitcom he was in? Wasn't it yeah. Major Dad? Major was that, Dad, That was yeah. Gerald McCraney, wasn't yeah. it? <laughs> totally he's had like forgot. three hit TV yeah. shows. And Deadwood. And Deadwood, yeah. 
Yeah, it was it was we it, it started as there were actually the whole family was in like four episodes of Touched by an Angel, but it started with the Della Reese come to Gerald McRae and saying like I have a mission for you, and it's like go meet people in the U.S. Yeah, and he's like all right, I touched you. Uh, it ran <laughs> it ran for sixty nine episodes over three seasons on CBS. Sixty nine. Um, also forget that Touched by an Angel ran for like eleven years. I moved, that show went on forever. People loved Highway to Heaven, Touch by an no. Angel, Father Dowling Mysteries. There oh, was yeah. My, big mom, old... my mom watched all those. Yes, there was... Look, there's no... Uh, there's no reason why there shouldn't be religious oh, programming no. for people. No. But they didn't... The, the, the thing is they didn't take it to the level, you know what I no, mean? No, not like the Christian media is doing now. Yeah. And that's the thing, is that these weren't... They were based around religion, but they weren't overtly religious. It no. was just like, hey, be nice to each other. Yes. And and be good. Yes. You know, and then people, took, people want that. They took the universal truths of religion, the, the positive parts right. of it, and used that, which is yeah. what you should do. Yes. Uh, O'Brien has since retired from acting and now runs his own photography company. Nice. Yeah. He's, his last role was around like 2009, I think, 2010. Uh, just decided he was done. Charles Dance was cast as Mr. Benedict, the bad guy. God, he's so good. And talk about character arc. Yeah. His character arc in this is so amazing. Well, it's also when they get a really good actor yeah. in a movie with okay actors. Yeah. Like, <laughs> kind of runs away with the show. He does. And his performance, he just seems like such an interesting guy to me. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, he's somebody I'd want to sit down and pick his brain. A hundred percent. And he has looked the same oh, yeah. since, like, 1970 oh, to yeah. now. He's he is the, one of those guys who's always looked like he's fifty. Yeah, he, he could be <laughs> somewhere between thirty and sixty. Yeah, and he's just kind of popped around in that range for a while. That's so great. But uh, yes, he was when he was dealing with Anthony Quinn, and Anthony Quinn would always mess up the sayings like, "You're in front of the eight ball, my friend. <laughs> You're behind the eight ball, you idiot." And it it was just <laughs> it was really his. You're absolutely right, man. His realization. Yeah. Of the world. Like, when he was walking around the real world, oh, and at yeah. first it was kind of fear. Yeah. And then yeah. when he realized that in this world, nobody gives an ass. Yeah. You could yeah. be as evil as you want. People leave you alone. That was just... Oh, it was great. His acting was impeccable, man. Oh, I did. Excuse me. I need you to help me with an experiment. Yes, excuse me. Uh, yeah, he he's so phenomenal. He's so good. What do you uh, need from me? And also, he, had, he was also well-written because... One of my favorite things, the second he heard the kid say what the I was, he knew that the kid somehow knew. Yeah. And the only conclusion was that the kid was some otherworldly being or something, but he was like, I- I'm going to be smart enough to figure this out and yes. get the kid and make this happen. None of that dumb, Yeah. you know, everybody in the audience knows what's going on, but the idiot doesn't. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. the most yeah. frustrating thing in the world to me yeah. is when everybody's just like, come on, man, you're supposed to be the smartest detective in the world, and we figured all this <laughs> out before you? This out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the role of Benedict was originally written for William Atherton, well known for his appearance as the EPA inspector in Ghostbusters, Professor Jerry Hathaway in Real Genius, and the slimy TV reporter Richard Thornburg in Die Hard. Uh, yeah, he's great. He wasn't. I'm glad he wasn't cast. No, I don't think he would have been. He would not have brought the gravity that Charles Dance did. No, he would have been funny, and he would have been slimy and goofy because yeah, yeah. he plays slime ball better than any so human well. being on the planet. <laughs> so well. Uh, I'm looking at you, Die Hard, but uh, or any of those movies because he basically played a dick. Yeah, he was the consummate yeah. dick, but he didn't have. You're right. He didn't have the tinge of evil or that uncertain aspect to him that made him dangerous. Like yes, Charles Dance. that Charles Dance man. Every time you looked at him, it was like I don't know if you you could literally do anything. Right. Like it exactly. Was, it was just so unnerving. Completely unpredictable. Yeah. And and because the 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 fun. That that character was having in his eye, you know, oh, it, yeah, like yeah. when he had the daughter and the, the standoff at the house, it, and with all the, you know, it's just, and also his uh, impatience with all, with it all. Oh you know? yeah, yeah. It just the stupidity of it. He was kind of the audience in yeah, a way. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> this is really dumb. Uh, apparently, Timothy Dalton was cast as Mr. Benedict originally, but had to withdraw due to prior commitments. He would have been great, too. He would have been fun. Timothy's yeah. uh, Timothy, like I know him. We're Timothy. Pals. Good, good pal, Tim. Mr. Dalton, uh, he was great in, uh, what was that weird DC show on Max with uh, Brendan Fraser? 
Oh, the Doom Patrol. Doom Patrol, yeah. Yeah, he was great in Doom Patrol. Yeah, yeah, he's he, he's actually a really great actor. He is. I, 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 he would have been interesting. I'm still glad it was Charles Dance. But, he is. Uh, uh, Tim Curry and Alan Rickman were also considered for the role of Benedict. Both would have been great, too. Yeah, they would have. Yeah, they've, they've proven themselves. Yeah. I think, again, as much as I love Tim Curry, there's a certain baggage attached to him yeah. that yeah. Charles Dance didn't have. And I think the reason why Charles Dance was more effective than most of these guys is that people didn't really know him. Yeah. Not American audience definitely did not know him. Because at this yeah. time, you know, he was Frank, uh, Curry was Frankenfurter. Yeah. And I believe he had done Pennywise, right? Was that 92 oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. or 91 maybe? No, it was before this. Yeah, yeah. It was definitely before this. So there's two name, iconic I think it was 90. roles. I, yeah, 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 I think you're right. And 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 he was in you know did, Clue did Tim he in Clue he played uh, that the Tom Cruise movie he played the big uh, demon, devil yeah the devil, legend you know, legend yeah I mean he had he had, had a much longer career uh, it, I, the funny thing is that Charles Dance said in interviews that after being told that he had won a part turned down by Alan Rickman because of the salary he wore a T-shirt on set which which read I'm cheaper than Alan Rickman <laughs> that's hilarious he has such a great sense of humor. he's awesome. Uh, Dance got his acting start with the Royal Shakespeare Company in England. Like most actors in England, he started working on British television. His first role was in the sitcom Father Brown in 1974, uh, which uh, on, may not be known as well to American audiences, but it was a huge classic sitcom in Britain. Oh, yeah. I think they Father did a, an American remake of that as Probably. well. Probably. But it ran for years, and, and it was huge. Uh, Dance's first feature film was in the Bond film For Your Eyes Only in 1981, playing the henchman Klaus. Klaus. Uh, he continued his villainous ways by playing Sardo Numpsa in The Golden Child. Ah, Numpsy! <laughs> oh, n- uh, listen to our Golden Child episode for more on that. Uh, he was so good in that. Yeah, he would. Yeah, he would. Yeah, he would. <laughs> yes, he was. <laughs> uh, he'd made a ton of movies over the years, including... Alien 3, Space Truckers, Michael Collins, Hillary and Jackie, Godsford Park, Ali G, In the House, and Swimming Pool. Swimming Pool is such a good... Have you it's seen it? It's a great movie. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Dance made his writing and directing debut in 2003 with Ladies in Lavender, starring Judy Dench and Maggie Smith. It's a good movie. Oh, really? Yes. I haven't seen it. It is a very good movie, and I had no idea he directed it. He wrote and directed it. Well, good for him, he's, because yeah. it, it doesn't cease to amaze me. Well, it's, he's <laughs> a very... It's like a... It makes sense that he's a theater guy. Right. You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's probably most well-known to American audiences due to playing Tywin Lannister over 27 episodes on Game of Thrones. Uh unceremoniously, spoiler alert, murdered in the toilet. Yep, just like Elvis, he died on the toilet, but unlike Elvis, he was killed by his son. (laughs) Dance will be seen in the upcoming Guillermo del Toro adaptation of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which will be released on Netflix. Yes, I'm playing Igor. Uh, It's um, Dr. Frankenstein is being played by Oscar Isaac. Yeah. And then there is some kid, some kid that's in the kissing booth. One and two that's playing Frankenstein? Okay. I was like, okay. But everybody else is like huge names. I was like, all right. Fine. I, 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 uh, I've I had my fill of Oscar Isaac. I've decided. Yeah. <laughs> he, he and uh, Chris Pratt and yeah. a couple other guys can go sit on a ship somewhere. Yeah. And... Uh, he'll also be in the miniseries adaptation of The Day of the Jackal, which I didn't know they were making, starring Eddie Redmayne. <sighs> Eddie Redmayne's playing the jackal. The, the, the terrorist? Yeah. He's the hired assassin. Eddie yeah. Redmayne? Eddie Redmayne. Oh, man. I'm, He's going to kill it. I am definitely over Eddie Redmayne. <laughs> I've been over Eddie Redmayne before I even knew who he was. <laughs> I cannot stand his performance. Lovely man. Lovely man, probably. But uh, I'm sure he is. He is not somebody I like watching. Okay. All right. No uh, offense. <laughs> Robert Prosky uh, was cast as Nick the Projectionist. I. Uh, Nick was originally written to be the devil, but the producers nixed the idea. Good, because that's stupid. Uh, I, for the first, like, half the movie, or especially when he comes in and then suddenly Nick is super weird at the midnight screening, it makes sense, but then at the end it was like, that didn't make any sense at all. No, it's more, it's better if, if it's kind of wholesome, you know what I I mean? I know, I agree, I agree. I mean, the magic of the movies is a much more fun time than the devil trying to kill a kid. Right, right. Yeah, the irony of, of it being a ticket that was essentially created or whatever by Houdini and made it supernatural when Houdini hated the supernatural. <laughs> famously. <laughs> Very uh, famously hated the supernatural. Gave his wife a word and said that if anybody tried to do a seance, right. he would say this word to prove that there was an afterlife. And guess what? 
It never happened. Never she happened. did seances for like 10 years. Yeah. After, after his, every night on the, the day he died, October 31st, would do a seance and then finally was like, well, he's obviously not coming back. Right. But she also, <laughs> ching ching Yeah. Well, of course. ching 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 That's money sounds. And I'm That's rubbing my fingers sounds. together. Rubbing fingers, yeah. Uh, Prosky made his feature film debut in Thief in 1981, written and directed by Michael Mann and starring James Caan. And Jim Belushi, who was in this movie. Uh, great movie. I love Thief. I haven't seen it in a long time. It's just one of those slow rolling yeah. 70s crime movies, you know, and you, know, you got the best thief in the world. Yeah. And his yeah. buddy Jim Belushi. And he got one more score. <laughs> He's had a really long career appearing in Christine in 1983. Are you shit us? <laughs> yeah, you gotta get those shitters. Uh, the Natural in 1984. Yeah, you gotta get. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, he owned the team. He was the guy that owned the team. I own the team. Uh, broadcast News in 1987. Yeah, you gotta put the news on. Which honestly, I always forget. Broadcast News exists. Yeah, it was uh, such a good movie. Holly Hunter's first yeah. film. Uh, the Great Outdoors in 1988 which is one of my favorite comedies. Very good. Uh, Loose Cannons and Gremlins 2, The New Batch, 1990, both of which we've covered. <laughs> so please listen to our Loose Cannons and or Gremlins 2, The New Batch. That was the third of our sequels. That oh, that's right. And Gremlins 2. Is yeah. good or better than the yeah. Ridge. Uh, yeah, so Loose Cannons starring Gene Hackman and Dan Aykroyd and Gremlins 2. Uh, we've, we've just go listen to those episodes. Me, 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 me. Loose crazy. Cannons was such a weird movie, but I love it so much. <laughs> it is. Check out Loose Cannons, man. <laughs> so weird. Uh, in 1984, he was cast as the desk sergeant in Hill Street Blues, appearing in 54 episodes over four seasons. That's where most people know him, and yeah. he was great. Yeah. Uh, Prosky's final film, released posthumously, was The Skeptic in 2009, starring Tim Daly, Zoe Saldana, and Tom Arnold. Okay. It looked pretty bad. I'm sure. Uh, he died on December 8th, 2008, from complications from heart surgery at 77 years old. Ah, uh, too young. Yeah. And you never know what your last film's going to be. I know. Well, that's true. He was working. He, he didn't know I'm he not, was going to I'm not judging the movie for him. I'm not judging his choice to be in the movie. I'm just judging the movie. Idiot. Your last movie was stupid. You deserve to die. This is why you died, this is man. You died, Prosky. Oh, God. Tom Noonan was cast as the Ripper, the main antagonist of Jack Slater 3. Noonan. Uh, Noonan is actually, actually 6'5. I didn't realize he was that tall. Oh, yeah. He's huge. Uh, it meant that he was cast quite often as villains, such as in Manhunter in 1986 for Michael Mann, the first Hannibal Lecter adaptation where Noonan plays the serial family killer Francis Dollarhide. Dollarhide. Oh, yes. What do you movie. see? What do you see? <laughs> I am becoming what do you see? Ah! He was uh, great. And, and uh, Brian Cox played oh, Hannibal, Hannibal Lecter. Lecter. He was so, so good. good. So good. Uh, if you have not seen Manhunter, yeah. do it today. Highly recommend it. It is one of the greatest. It's Michael Mann. Yeah. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. It's so good. I, I like it better than Silence of the Lambs. Okay. I love Silence of the Lambs, but it's just I saw it first and it's kind of sure. a, you know. I, yeah, it's the same reason why I like Silence of the Lambs more, because I saw it before I saw Manhunter. Sure. Uh, Frankenstein's monster he played in the Monster Squad in 1987. Yeah. Uh, a goon in Collision Course, the Pat Morita J. Leno vehicle that was filmed in 1989 but unreleased until home video in 1992. I believe that's the only movie that Jay Leno ever did. and Or like starred in. Lead, yeah. And thank God. Uh, the funny thing is that apparently according, at one point, Shortly after they finished filming in 89, Jay Leno was doing guest hosting for Carson. Uh -huh. And Pat Morita was on, and they talked about it, and how they literally, the last day of filming, the producers came over and said, we're out of money. And then that was it. They couldn't, they couldn't do, they can do post-production, they can do any editing. They were like, we don't have any money. And so the movie just sat on a shelf for like three years. <laughs> yeah, no, they didn't have any money anyway. Like, <laughs> was, they still had stuff to shoot. Like, it was still, like, they were like, man, we're out of money. Sorry. It was uh, it, it, awful. I, I know I saw this. I know it was on, like, cable yeah. TV. I know that I saw it. And I'm sure it was absolutely atrocious. They're uh, cops. Like, uh, you know, yeah, going after car thieves. I don't know what something. Yeah, what's the cop? You know, there's homicide and there's the narcotics. Narcotics, but what's the? Is it bunko? What is grand, grand theft? I don't know. Grand theft. Yeah. Whatever the division of people that right. you know go yeah. after stolen cars. That was he and Marita. I think he was wearing all jeans, like jean jacket, jean pants. Yeah. Oh yeah. A lot of denim. Suit. A lot of denim. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like, I like Daniel, you know? It's this very is comfortable. the <laughs> most anyone's ever talked about this movie in 30 years. <laughs> and it, uh, it's more, it's like five <laughs> minutes more than it should have been talked about. Uh, and uh, Tom Noonan also was cast as Kane, a drug cartel leader in Robocop 2 in 1990. Yep, he was great. He's always great. He's great. He's so fantastic. And the nicest guy, too. Like, if you yeah. see interviews or just... He just seems like yeah. such a friendly, happy this dude. My f- absolute favorite thing is when he walks up and is talking to the current affair people or whatever. Entertainment and, Tonight. Entertainment Tonight. And he's just, like, smiling and is like, hey. And mm. it's like, that's so not who you play. Talking to Lisa Gibbons. Yeah. Uh, Newton's last credits are in 2017 with Wonderstruck from Todd Haynes, the 12th... Uh, Wonderstruck with, from Todd Haynes, which I've never seen. Did not realize that was even a movie. Neither did I. Um, uh, the 12 Monkeys TV show that ended in 2018, and a voiceover role in Animals, the HBO animated show in 2018. Yes! Yes! He was ex- hilarious. Uh, he is currently teaching acting at Paradise, Paradise Theater, which he founded in 1983. Ooh, where is He that? just isn't acting very much anymore. Is that in L.A.? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't think I'd so. Like to take I think it's in, I think it's in New York. Uh, Frank McRae was cast as Lieutenant Decker, their captain. Their <laughs> uh, he was cast in this movie because of his role as a shouting police captain in 48 Hours in 1982. Yeah, that is the trope of yeah. every cop show, cop every movie. Cop show, yeah, cop. Gotta have the yelling. Radio program. <laughs> Which was cop video played game. to perfect uh, opposites in Brooklyn Nine-Nine with... Uh, the captain, Captain Holt. Yes. Who just was so not that at all. And in So I Married an Axe Murderer. Oh, yeah. When he yeah. wanted the captain to right. be like this captain. Right, right. He was played, just played very well. One of the greatest, uh, that was uh, Alan Arkin. Oh, yeah, Alan played. Arkin. Oh, he was so Oh, do you, do, you, do, you th- do you think that was... Uh, was Rachel Slayer a little bit too much? A little too much. Uh, I think it was over the time. I could try it again. Oh, it was great. It was great. It was great. Okay. Yeah. Uh, McRae's... Uh, he would actually make an uncredited cameo in the sequel, Another 48 Hours, as the same character in 1990. Nice. Uh, McRae's feature film debut was in Shaft in Africa in 1973, the third in the Shaft series. Shut your mouth. Shut your mouth. Uh, McRae would pair with John Candy twice as Bumbling Tank Soldiers in 1941, released in 1979, directed by Steven Spielberg. <laughs> that movie is a mess. Yeah. But it's fun mess, but it is a mess. It is, like, the messiest, one of the messiest movies I've ever seen. Oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, they would pair as Bumbling Security Guards and National Lampoon's Vacation in 1983. They were good at bumbling. Yeah, I did not, it did not realize this was the same guy. Yeah. Like, this is how night and day the characters are. He was a really great actor, and yeah. he didn't, you know, he was very good at being the over-the-top. He could oh, play yeah. it for comedy, he could play it for drama, and he was a lot more well-rounded as an actor than... Oh, yeah. Than these typical parts that you see him right, in. Right, right. His last role was as Cookie in the Hallmark Channel original Christian films Love's Long Journey and Love's Abiding Joy, uh, released in 2005 and 2006. Uh, and then he retired. Uh, on April 29th, 2021, McRae died from a heart attack in Santa Monica at the age of 80. Oh. See? Yeah. You don't retire. and then Because yeah, if you retire, you die. Got to keep working. Well, I mean, it took another 15 years. Still died. Just uh, took a little longer. It's true. Wow. You're right. You're right. Uh, Anthony Quinn was cast as Tony Vivaldi, the main antagonist of Jack Slater 4. Uh, you got to stand behind and there's a fire on the building. Quinn was born to a Mexican mother and an Irish Mexican father. His notable films include La Strada, The Guns of Navarro, Lawrence of Arabia, Guns for San Sebastian, The Shoes of the Fisherman, Across 110th Street, The Message, Line of the Desert, Jungle Fever, and Seven Servants. Uh, Quinn won the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor twice for his Viva Zapata in 1952 and Lust for Life in 1956. He was a great actor, and he was really good in Jungle Fever, too. Oh, yeah, yeah. Speaking uh, of Spike Lee. Yeah. Uh, his starring performance in Zorba the Greek in 1964 earned him an Oscar nomination for Best Actor. And why everybody thought he was Greek for his entire life. Yes. Uh, he was also nominated for Best Actor in 1957 for Wild is the Wind. He was a very, very good actor. He was an extremely passionate actor. Yes. And he put everything he had into his performance. Yeah. And he was an exceptional actor. And, you know, he, he didn't get the due that he deserved towards the end of his career. But, man. No, but he was, yeah. At the height of it, that guy was one of the best. 
Uh, his final film role was released in 2002, Avenging Angelo, co-starring Sylvester Stallone and Madeline Stowe. Yeah, Avenging Angelo, it's like a guy in the mob, you know, it's bad, bad movie, so yeah. bad, yeah. oh, it's bad. Uh, Quinn died of respiratory failure due to complications from radiation treatment for lung cancer on June 3rd, 2001 in Boston at the age of 86. F you, cancer, F you. I will say, I've said it before, I will say it again. The indignity that people have to go I to know, if they're lucky enough to get old is just I know, it's, it's awful. Uh, Bridget Wilson was cast as Whitney Slater, Jack's daughter. Wilson also plays Meredith Caprice, the actress who plays Whitney in the Slater films. So good at playing both roles. <laughs> uh, Wilson was crowned Miss Teen USA in 1990. Beautiful young lady. Oh, yeah. Last Action Hero was her feature film debut. She'd been on the soap opera Santa Barbara for 20 episodes in 1992. You know, I just have to say... Uh, the relationship between her and Danny is a little bit as creepy as the relationship between Leah Thompson and Howard T. Duck. Yeah, it's a little weird. A little kissy, a little flirty. And I get it. It's the inside of a movie, and it's the kid's yeah. fantasy or whatever. But still, it was a little creeps. Yeah, I mean, she was in college. Yeah. He, and he was 10. <laughs> even though Skis, Skis, Skeezy, Skeezy yeah. was a little guy... He yeah. wasn't that little was, of a guy. He was in college yes. of appropriate age. She did a cameo as a student in the film Higher Learning, but shot to fame acting opposite Adam Sandler and Billy Madison in 1995. Higher Learning was not a good movie. That same year, she also performed as Sonya Blade in Mortal Kombat. Mortal Kombat! Boom, I, boom, boom, bang, I bang, just boom. have to thank my mother again for taking me to that and sitting through that entire movie. Your when poor I know mother. She wanted to be anywhere else. Oh my God, everybody did except for you. Uh, I loved that movie so much. It was so bad. How it was old were so you? Bad. I would have been like 16. Oh, wow. Am I 15? I'm old enough to know better. Old that. No, that's actually the perfect time for watching one of those movies. Cause 16? I was 16, I'm pretty sure. But yeah. Yeah, that's about the 13, 14. That's when I saw Highlander. You make a lot of bad movie choices in the, in the I, early teens. It was the, It was based on the video game. I was all obsessed. I get it. Yeah. I saw it. <laughs> it wasn't a good movie. No. Guilty pleasure, for sure. And I loved the soundtrack. Oh, buddy. <laughs> the look of joy on your face saying that. I don't think I've seen you happier. Uh, after marrying tennis superstar Pete Sampras in 2000 and having two kids in 2002 and 2005, she opted to turn away from acting. No. Uh, her last film role was in 2008 with Phantom Punch starring Ving Rhames as Sonny Liston. Yeah, not, not that not great. great. Uh, sadly, Wilson was diagnosed with ovarian cancer in 2022. Oh, God damn it. Uh, she went through surgery, chemotherapy, and as of October 2023, was receiving targeted maintenance therapy for the cancer. Well, good. So I think she's pulled through it, but I couldn't find any more recent information. Well, let's all think some good I, thoughts I, for Bridget. I, I, I think that she's gone through it, and then she's in um, remission, remission, and that she is taking care of her kids, and that she's happy. Good. Yeah. Kids are probably taking care of her because they're probably in their 20s now. (laughs) Uh, 2002. Yeah. I mean, they would be in their early 20s. Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully they're taking care of their mom because she needs it. Take care of your mom, Bridget Wilson's uh, kids. And Pete Sampras and her are still married, and he is is one of the most loving... Funny guys. Really? Like he was, oh yeah. When he finally came out, he like, it was a whole article in like People Magazine, but he was like, I, I have just have to tell people about this since like my wife has had cancer for the last like 10 months and, and like, he's like, we're just doing everything we can, you know, but, uh, but he's a good dude. I always liked Pete Sampras. Yeah. He was a good dude. Uh, F. Murray Abraham was cast as John Practice. F. You, Murray Abraham. <laughs> After appearing in In the Name of the Rose in 1986 as the villain and killing Mozart in Amadeus in 1985, which he won an Academy Award for, Abraham was tired of playing the bad guys and wanted to return to his background of comedy. No, nope, he still played a bad guy, spoiler well, alert. Well, the funny thing is that he went to the theater and played King Lear in 1991 because that is the funniest Shakespeare play of all time. It's hilarious. Um, uh, and then he played Roy, Roy Cohn in 1994 in the first run of of Angels in America, another hilarious part. Oh, I, I, I realized as I was writing this and as I was watching this movie that I really don't like F. Murray Abraham. Yeah, he seems kind of like he'd be a bit of a prick in real life. Yeah. And, all, and yeah. if you've listened to our Name of the Rose. <laughs> Listen to our In the Name of the Rose. Uh, apparently he was an insufferable prick on that because he had won an Academy Award and was a real dick about it to yeah. Sean Connery. Yeah. Where's your and, Academy Award, Sean? <laughs> and the director. He was a dick to the director. Like, I, I, I can't. 
But there's also quotes. He also seems like a good family guy because didn't he like take off time to raise his kids or something while his wife was working? He was or... going to because his career wasn't working. Okay. But he just does kind of have an air of... Yeah. There's something about him that just bothers me. The re- I... F is a good... Uh... Initial yes. to start his name, is that what you're saying? Yes. Uh, Abraham made an appearance in the Bonfire of the Vanities from Brian De Palma, but refused to be credited due to a contract dispute. Yeah. Well, also, the dispute was the movie was awful. Well, yeah. Uh, he actually did a comedy in 1993, along with Last Action Hero, appearing in National Lampoon's Loaded Weapon 1 as Dr. Harold Leecher, their Hannibal Lecter parody. Yeah, he should have stuck with uh, drama, because he wasn't very funny. <laughs> Uh, that movie was fine, though. It was it, I, it, for being a National Lampoon's movie. It was fine. Yeah, uh, like, I, I, it, it helped propel uh, Sam Jackson into yeah. stardom. It was like I think it was his first him, starring him role. And, uh, Emilio Estevez. Mids. Yeah, Abraham can most recently be seen in Mother Couch, released in 2023, co-starring Ewan McGregor. All right. It was based off a, of, I think, a Swiss novel or something. Yeah. Uh, Mercedes Rule was cast as Irene Madigan, Danny's mother. I completely forgot that she existed. And then after watching this movie again, I fell in love with her all over again. Oh, she's so good. She is such an underrated actor. Yeah. She always gives... Her performance in The Fisher King is one of the greatest yeah. performances, you know, not ever. But it, it was... She does comedy. Well, I mean, she won a Best Supporting Actress Oscar for it. So, as she I mean, showed up. Yeah. She was so good and so... I mean, she always is just so heartfelt and real. Uh, on top of that Academy Award she won, she also won a Golden Globe Award, a Tony Award, a Drama Desk Award, two Obie Awards, and two Outer Critics Circle Awards. So technically she won an EGOT. Uh, yeah, kind of. No Emmys. No Emmys. No Grammys. So she got an ought. She got an oot because <laughs> she got a, a Ovation Award or whatever. Uh, Rule had her first credited role on the daytime soap The Doctors in 1979. That same year, she also played a policewoman in The Warriors. Yeah, yeah. I totally didn't realize she was in that. Yeah. In 1980, she was nearly cast in the sixth season of Saturday Night Live, losing her slot to Denny Dillon. Well, not a, the best choice there, Lord. Who's Denny Dillon? She was a, she. She was kind of a blonde, heavyset woman. She's funny. She was funny. But All I right. think this was the Dick Ebersole it was, it was at, yeah, it was right after they ki- they canceled everybody, not canceled everybody, they fired everybody and then restarted the cast because it was, yeah, it was that season. Yeah, and that was, that was with like Anthony Michael Hall and yeah. Robert Downey Jr. and yeah, it was Eddie weird. Murphy. And, the whole thing was weird. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was because Dick Ebersole took over for Lorne Michaels, I think from, that was the only season. Which oh, well, no, got, as soon as that, yeah, because as soon as that season, they were like, oh, uh, we're going to give you all the money you want to come back. Yeah, and because it, they came uh, hairs close to canceling. Yeah, yeah. it was Saturday so Night Live was so canceling. bad. Yeah. Uh, in 1988, she appeared as Josh's mom in Big and as Connie Russo in Married to the Mob. Oh, yeah. Both uh, great performances. I always keep forgetting that she's in Big. She's so good in that. There's just that, that one heartfelt moment when she's talking to the friend and she's like, I just want Josh back. Yeah. Like, it's so heartbreaking. It's, yeah, well, that's why she was so good. Yeah. Because she played mom's... Like real moms, yeah, you know, yeah. not overly you be- cloying. You know, you believed, yeah. She had that toughness and the sensitivity, that combination yeah. of the tough love mom that everybody was kind of like, I kind of wish you were my mom. Yeah, yeah. And this is and this was so great because after they get in the real world and Arnie is in there talking to his wife, he comes, Danny comes in and they're talking at breakfast and he's just like, oh man. Danny, you, you should have told your mother where you were. You broke him. You broke him. Yeah, you made him a wimp, mom. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Rule will be seen in the upcoming film The Nana Project, directed by Robin Givens. Excellent. I'm so glad she's still working. Yeah, she's I... been in a ton of other stuff. Like, I mean, she's still, she still is in something at least once a year. Good. So. I need to look for that stuff, because I really enjoy her, and I, I, have, I haven't seen her in anything yeah. that I know of in a long time. Uh, Art Carney was cast as Frank Slater, Jack's second cousin. Uh, excuse me, Jack's favorite second cousin. <laughs> <laughs> he is his favorite second cousin. Uh, he, he was best known for his role as Ed Norton on the sitcom The Honeymooners. Oh, man. Hey, Rolf. Hey, Rolf. What you doing, Rolf? Yeah. What's going on, Rolf? Hey, I, Rolf. Here's hey, Rolfie. The funny thing I found out was that The Honeymooners only ran for one season. Well, yeah, 39 I mean. 39 episodes. I realized, and then I did a deeper dive into it, and there was a lot more to The Honeymooners right. than just the one season. But it only ran as a sitcom for 39 episodes. Which is crazy. because It blows my mind. It, it, you see, you would think that it was like 11, 12. It was like yeah. Bonanza. I mean, given the fact that it was so huge and, and became a cookie cutter for every sitcom after it. Well, Jackie Gleason was the biggest star in the world. Oh, yeah. Then. He was huge. He was huge. Hey, what are you saying? You're calling me fake. 
Uh, Carney has won an Academy Award, a Golden Globe Award, and six Primetime Emmy Awards. He's great. Uh, he won a Best Actor Oscar for Harry and Tonto in 1974. Great movie. He beat out Albert Finney, Dustin Hoffman, Jack Nicholson, and Al Pacino. It's an amazing performance. That is impressive. Yeah. yeah. you got to see that. I don't know if you've I've seen it. I've never seen Harry and Tonto. We'll, we'll cover it. Yeah. And, uh, but, yeah, I think... I think you'll really enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he also won the Golden Globe for Harry and Tonto in 74. Uh, he won six Emmy Awards for his portrayal of Ed Norton from The Honeymooners, two for the original Jackie Gleason show, one for The Honeymooners, and two for the final version of The Jackie Gleason Show after. Uh, in 1984, in fact, he was nominated seven times and won six. Nice. Yeah. Uh, in 1984, he appeared in Firestarter, the Stephen King adaptation, and The Muppets Take Manhattan. Yeah, same thing. <laughs> <laughs> two sides of the same coin, man. According to Carney, he was an alcoholic by his late teens. Good Lord. Oof. His stage partner, comedian Ollie O'Toole, would order gin and grapefruit juice for us in the morning, and oh, gee, it was great. Carney later used barbiturates, amphetamines, and alcohol substitutes. To battle his addiction, which he said ran in the family, he tried psychotherapy and joined Alcoholics Anonymous. Wow. Uh, he finally found success with antabuse and quit drinking during the filming of Harry and Tonto. Good for him. Yeah. I mean, he did it. It took a long time, but he did it. Well, you got to find the right fit for you. Right. right. You know, Alcoholics Anonymous isn't for everybody. No. It's, it, yeah, not one size fits all. Exactly. And it's, it, take, it takes a lot of courage, and it takes a, a, a lot of work to get to where he, he got, he, and the fact that he went through so many different... Yes. The fact that he kept trying. Yes. Because, like, Alcoholics Anonymous didn't work, but he could have just gone back to drinking. Yeah. But no, he's like, no, i got to figure this out. He was um, determined to get help, and he did. And that's that's remarkable. Most people yeah. don't. And and people that overcome addiction are remarkable people. Agreed. People, it's like overcoming cancer, or it's like yeah. overcoming yeah. whatever. I mean, it's, it's, it's a monumental thing that deserves a lot of yeah. appreciation. Uh, last action hero was Carney's final film role. Uh, he died at a care home in Chester, Connecticut on November 9th, 2003, five days after his 85th birthday. Oh, I'm sad he died in a home. Yeah. Uh, Professor Toru Tanaka, credited as the, credited as the tough Asian man, uh, is Vivaldi and Benedict's bodyguard. Yeah. Uh, Tanaka, whose real name is Charles Kalani, uh, was best known for his work with the World Wide Wrestling Federation, the WWF, now known as the WWE. Yeah. Yeah. He was, what was his wrestling name? Professor Toru Tanaka. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. He was a three-time tag team champion. Do you with... know what he was a professor of? I don't know. I mean. It was women's studies. He was a professor of butt kicking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he was a three-time tag team champion uh, with partner Mr. Fuji. And one-time international tag team, champ, tag team champion with Mitsu Arakawa. All right. I guess uh, they all had to be Asian together. He was really big in the 70s. It was a big thing. Uh, by the early 1980s, Kalani's body could not handle the beatings in the ring any longer, and he moved into the film world on a more permanent basis. Again, another athlete. He was also a heavyweight boxer, too. Uh, but yeah, he, he, he became an actor. Although I, you fall back on? I will say that the pipeline from world wrestling to acting is a little bit more, makes a lot more sense because you're acting, you're acting <laughs> yeah, yeah. As, a, as a wrestler. A wrestler. Uh, his first film was the 1981 Chuck Norris vehicle, An Eye for an Eye. Oh, I saw that. <laughs> uh, he also appeared opposite Arnie in The Running Man as Sub-Zero, the red armor-clad stalker, who is a sadistic hockey samurai with a scythe that... Slices his enemy's limb from limb into quivering bloody sushi. Sub-Zero. My f- favorite description of any <laughs> character. Uh, other notable roles include... The Perfect Weapon, Three Ninjas, Black Rain, Dark Man, Alligator 2, The Mutation, and Pee-wee's Big Adventure as Francis Buxton's butler. Yeah. His last film was 1995's Hard Justice, starring David Bradley and Charles Napier in an uncredited role. Okay. Uh, he died of heart failure on August 22nd. 2000. Oh. He had to have been his, in his early 60s. He was not that old. Too young. Yeah. Black Rain is a really good movie. It is. It is. Dark Man is a guilty movie. I really love Dark Man. There were a number of cameos in Last Action Hero. Uh, this movie about movies. They got as many people <laughs> in as they could. Uh, Tina Turner, which was actually her final film role. Uh, she didn't pass away until 2023, but she stopped acting after this movie. I totally forgot that she died. Yeah. She died I had year. to mourn yeah. all over again. Yeah. 
Uh, Sharon Stone as Catherine Trammell from Basic Instinct, and Robert Patrick as the T-1000 appearing outside the LAPD headquarters. Yeah, both blink and you miss it. Yeah. Which is the, my favorite kind of cameos. Yeah, yeah. It was interesting that they got Sharon Stone to come back because she did not have a good time making Total Recall. Like, she no. was not a fan of Arnie. and Well, just the process. But I think that Arnie smoothed over and was like, eh, come on. Ah, come on, don't be a baby. Come and <laughs> be in the movie. It's two seconds. Come on. Yeah. What is wrong with you? And she got paid for it. So. Ah, you're going to get paid. Uh, veteran stuntman Al Leong, Henry Kingy, and Sven Ol Thorson as Vivaldi's henchman in the car chase. Yeah, I thought that was uh, Clint... Uh... Howard. <laughs> Howard. I think that was Henry Kingy. Uh, Sven Olthorsen was the guy in Harley Davidson and the Marlboro Man. He was one of the right. uh, one of the uh, the weird robot yeah, yeah. dudes. One of yeah. the the trench coat mafia. Trench coat mafia guys. Yeah, yeah. he he looks kind of like Arnold. Yeah, yeah. And he He's he was in Running Man. He yeah. was one of the he was the, like a security guard that kind of yeah 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 yeah. He's always in he in every with Arnold, Arnold movie. Pretty much every yeah. Arnold movie. But he just looks like a guy that'd be fun to have a beer with. Oh yeah yeah totally. Uh, Sylvester Stallone was the Terminator on a poster promoting Terminator 2 Judgment Day. Yeah, I'll be back. <laughs> uh, still a feast, baby. Uh, Angie Everhart as a video store clerk, which they actually credited her as a video babe in her feature film debut. Uh, my ex-wife, actually, um, you know. She, she points out, I just love that he like points out, he's like, this has to not be real. There's no way she would be working here. <laughs> it's true. She's way too pretty. Everybody was beautiful. So, you know, Angie Everhart was engaged to uh, Sylvester Stallone. Stallone. Yeah. yeah, we were engaged briefly. They didn't get married, you know, keep close. Jumped yeah. uh, Jennifer yeah. Flavin for her. Uh, mm-hmm. A lot of models, you know. Yes. They're all taller than me. It was very embarrassing. Okay. I don't like being a little guy. Hey, this isn't your movie. Please right. go away. Yeah. Oh, get out of here. <laughs> this isn't about you. Uh, at the Jack Slater 4 movie premiere, we see... Arnie's then-wife, Maria Shriver, Little Richard, Entertainment Tonight host, Lisa Gibbons, Jim Belushi, who starred with Schwarzenegger in Red Heat and later Jingle All the Way, Damon Wayans, Chevy Chase, Melvin Van Peebles, Entertainment reporter Chris Connolly, and Jean-Claude Van Damme. Uh, who actually worked with John McTiernan on the Schwarzenegger film Predator as the original Predator before dropping out. Yeah. And later co-starred with Schwarzenegger in The Expendables 2. Yes. I totally did not realize that he was the original Predator. Yeah, I have a soft spot for Van Damme. He's, oh, me he's, too. Uh, I think he's fantastic. He's a fascinating dude. Uh, as Jack and Danny enter the movie theater to find Arnold Schwarzenegger, MC Hammer asks Slater about a deal to do the Jack Slater 5 soundtrack. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Please, Hammer, don't hurt him. Uh, Ian McKellen was death emerging via the ticket stubs magic from Ingar, Ingmar Bergman's film The Seventh Seal. I did not know that until this viewing. Yeah. Because I didn't really know who he was when that movie came out. I don't uh, think anybody did. No, no, he wasn't huge. I mean, again, I think he was doing a lot of British stuff, but he was not huge in America. Danny DeVito in an uncredited role as Whiskers, the cartoon cat police detective. Ah, oh, thank you, Whiskers, for saving me. Ah, that's all right, Jack. You saved me a thousand times. <laughs> Uh, Colleen Camp is Officer Ratcliffe, the cop who retaliates and harassed by Whiskers in the police station. I love Colleen Camp. She's great. She's great. Uh, Joan Plowright is the English teacher who shows her class the 1948 film adaptation of Hamlet, which starred and was directed by Plowright's husband, Lawrence Olivier. I did not know they were married. Yeah. I love... I they were love. married when he passed away. Oh, Yeah. He was amazing. Lawrence Olivier was amazing. <laughs> he was an yeah. all right actor. Yeah, he was fine. He was okay. But Joan Plowright yeah. is so underrated. She's such a great actor. Yeah, yeah. So the merchandising people came up with some Jack Slater action figures with guns. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger vetoed the idea because this movie was a warmer, more cuddly action movie. How's more cuddly? Why don't you give them, like, um, I don't know, teddy bears and candy canes? Uh, Merchandising included seven video games, a $20 million Burger King promotion, a $36 million theme park ride, NASA's first paid ad in space. I remember that. And a four-story inflatable Jack Slater at Cannes. I remember that, too. And that's... Yeah, it was a big deal. They put, the, they put it on the side of the rocket as it was shooting off into space. This also added to the demise of this movie because people, especially at Cannes, they were like, this is gross. This is egregious. Yeah, yeah. The statue of him. It just seemed like they were, you know, taking over. They, again, they failed... To see the purpose of this movie, yeah, or yeah. that this movie was a parody and a takeoff, right, right. and just saw it as this example of the excesses of Hollywood right, and right. these big budgets, these soulless movies or whatever. All of this was kind of the perfect storm that yeah, led to yeah. the 
No, it wasn't even a disaster. We'll get to it, but no, it wasn't no, even a no. huge bomb. This is what drives me crazy. I know, I know. Uh, Schwarzenegger gave 40 television interviews and 54 print interviews in 24 hours, setting a new personal record. Jesus, that's amazing. It's a lot. What do you talk about by the last... Oh. All the same. You're saying the same thing to everybody. It was a very fun experience. Oh, we did a lot of work. This, I'm very this proud. Was, this was before you could give one interview, and then the internet would just copy it and right. placed it everywhere. You know, you had to li- literally give, oh, I got 54 cities I got to promote this thing to. Well, yeah, you would sit in a room, and yeah. then just uh, people would come shuffling yeah. in and out to yeah. ask you the same, same stupid questions, questions same things, over yeah. and over and over again. Yeah. Uh, Schwarzenegger wanted this movie to be PG-13, so it would appeal to a broader audience. Uh, this pays off with the whole Jack can't swear scene with Danny, when he tries to get him to read the word. I don't feel like saying it. <laughs> yeah, even though this is true, McCray, uh, Lieutenant Decker, actually says the F word in his final tirade in the movie. When he's doing all you the gibberish? At the end, yeah. Like, the very last thing when he comes in, and then and then uh, Arnie starts yelling at him, like, I'm the star. But you can actually hear him say the F word. Oh. Yeah. Uh, it's very fast. But I am the star of this movie. Yeah. Uh, being executive producer for the first time, uh, Arnie approved script director, cast, studio financing, distribution, marketing, budget, PR firm, planning, a form release, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Schwarzenegger enjoyed the added responsibility because he could be involved in every facet of the production. Yeah, I mean, he's a bit of a control freak. Yeah. Uh, the film was scored by composer Michael Kamen and peaked at number seven on the Billboard 200 chart. Weird. I know. Uh, the album, which was positively received by active rock radio outlets, was certified platinum on August 24th, 1993. So it was the soundtrack with all the songs, not just the score, right? There was one piece of score on the soundtrack. But yes, it was just the soundtrack. It contained heavy rock acts such as... ACDC, Alice in Chains, Megadeth, Queensryche, Def Leppard, Anthrax, Tesla, and Edo Smith. Along with Fishbone and Cypress Hill. Oh, I love Fishbone. Fishbone's great. I saw them so many times. Nice. The movie was released on June 18th, 1993 and made a global box office of $137.3 million from an $85 million budget. The most expensive film of 1993. That's like the price of an indie film now. I know. It's so crazy. Uh, One major reason for the movie's box office failure was the unforgiving process needed to have it ready for the studio-mandated June 18th, 1993 release date, which left almost no time for follow-up editing or fine-tuning after a disastrous May 1st sneak preview. This is where the studio starts to drop the ball. The movie ran so far behind schedule that they had just one test screening, which ran for two hours and 20 minutes with a lot of inaudible dialogue, completely boring the audience. So boring. Nothing worse. Nothing worse than being like, I'm going to go see your movie to give you feedback, and then it's just atrocious for two and a half hours. Well, inaudible dialogue. There was still some inaudible dialogue. I can not hear 90% of what Ian McKellen was saying. Well, the mixes aren't that great these days. Uh, there were discussions about moving the release into July or August in 1983, especially when Universal deliberately chose to open Jurassic Park on June 11th, but it was decided that doing so would turn off potential moviegoers. Dumb, 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 I, dumb, dumb. There's conflicting reports. Some people say that, that Arnie wanted to push it back, but then others are saying that he agreed with the studios because it's going to lose money. They were just so, they're like, think of the millions of dollars every week we're going to lose. And it's like, well... Think of the millions of dollars you're not going to get because you're opening the week after Jurassic Park. That was dumb. And it was it was shitty of Universal to be like, well, I know you guys chose this date. We're moving because originally Jurassic Park was open in like November or something, yeah. and they moved it to July uh, or June just to just to f with this movie. There was a lot more competition because movies were basically it back then. Yeah, you, know, you didn't. Yeah, movies and TV. You had video, but it wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't denting into box office because right. movies were the ultimate back then. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, the studios F with each other so much. I mean, that's the same reason why they made two asteroid movies or yeah. two yeah. volcano movies. It was just this they, stupid they, rivalry. You read, there's a press release that, oh, they're doing an asteroid movie. Hey, assistant, go find me that script. I remember that script about that asteroid. Let's get that and put that in, into turnaround. Yeah. Let's get that going. Let's green light it. Yeah. Let's fast track yeah, it. Let's fast track it. 
Uh, so the critics weren't very happy with the movie either. Roger Ebert gave the film two and a half stars out of four, writing that despite some entertainment, entertaining moments, Last Action Hero plays more like a bright idea than like a movie that was thought through. It doesn't evoke the mystery of the barrier between the audience and the screen the way Woody Allen did in The Purple Rose of Cairo. And a lot of the time, it simply seems to be standing around and commenting on itself. Why would he compare this to the Purple Rose of Cairo? It's, you know, because he's, it's just, it's again not getting it. Look, I, I know I do a, an impeccable impersonation of him that's filled with nothing but uh, admiration. But I do, right. you know, he did a pretty good job as a critic. I much more prefer him I, than Siskel. I love Roger Ebert. I think he's a fantastic critic. Yes. I, I don't agree with him a lot of the times. But no, but I think when he misses the mark... He misses the mark. Yeah. And yeah. it's not and it's necessarily it's not necessarily because of the movie, it's because of either what he was expecting or comparing right. it to something else. Right. And there's no comparison between this uh, and the purple rose. Worse than that is uh Siskel. Siskel is even worse when that happens. Ah. Like he's he just is like he expects a movie to be what he wants it to be and then it's not and he gets mad. Well it in at least Ebert is kind of jolly when he gives his bad reviews. Yeah. Siskel is yeah. just mean and acerbic. Yeah, acerbic. That's the best way to describe Gene <laughs> Siskel. Uh, Vincent Canby likened the film to... A two-hour Saturday Night Live sketch. And called it... Something of a mess, but a frequently enjoyable one. John Ferguson of Radio Times was more positive, awarding it four stars out of five and stating, An Arnold Schwarzenegger backlash has been on the cards for some time, and when this extravaganza was released, the knives were well and truly out. It was actually a little unfair, because this is a smart, funny blockbuster. Schwarzenegger's rarely been better, and he is backed up by a never-ending stream of star names and cameo roles. And although McTiernan has fun spoofing the com- conventions of the action genre, he still manages to slip in some spectacular set pieces. Yeah, I feel like that's a pretty good description of this movie. I do, too. It's not a perfect movie, but it's fun. No, it is, it is fun, and there are... One of the things, we were watching it, and during the, uh, when we were watching it during the crane scene, mm-hmm. when uh, Fart, <laughs> yes, Don the Fart, Don or whatever, or whatever yeah. Name, yeah, Art the Fart, Art the yeah. Fart falls, no, when, when uh, Arnold falls, Art the Fart isn't on the hook. No, he's But then when he does, there. he is. I was like, oh, there's a mistake. And then you pointed out that McTiernan actually put in mistakes. Yeah. He, to make it more... He purposely made, in the movie world, there were mistakes that happened. Which is so great. I, there was apparently an Empire Magazine article that came out around the same time that claimed there were over 200 intentional gaffes, Whoa. as they call them. I did not see 200 intentional gaffes in this movie, but it's just, like, stuff that's bad editing and, like, things that yeah. don't match up, you know, like, but they did it on purpose because it's a movie. A spoof movie. Yeah, yeah. A movie about movies. A movie about movies. Uh, all about the film's failure and critical response, John McTiernan said, Initially, it was a wonderful Cinderella story with a nine-year-old boy. We had a pretty good script by Bill Goldman, charming, and this ludicrous hype machine got a hold of it, and it got buried under bullshit. It was so overwhelmed with baggage. And then it was whipped out unedited, practically assembled right out of the camera. It was in the theater five or six weeks after I finished shooting. It was kamikaze, stupid, no good reason for it. And then to open the week after Jurassic Park, God, to get to the depth of bad judgment involved in that, you need a snorkel. I think, I think your material is probably the most spot on <laughs> of all of the, <laughs> the impressions you do. It's the only one worthwhile. It's like he's in the room. Thank you. Uh, Arnie took all of this really hard and considered to, considered it to be the beginning of the end of his movie career. Oh, like he he went up in like six months, took six months off, like spent time in like Montana's ranch. Like he just got away from L.A. Well, I get it, man. I mean, like he took it all really personally. Well, for all intents and purposes, it should have been a hit. He also I didn't put this in, but one person he did blame for the movie, Bill Clinton. What? He claimed that because Clinton was getting elected that there was a backlash against these, like, you know, rah-rah movies. Anyway, so he took all this very hard, and he said, When the last action hero came out, uh, I had reached my peak after Terminator 2, having the most successful movie of the year worldwide. I cannot tell you how upset I was about negative last action hero reviews. It hurts you. It hurts your feelings. It's embarrassing. I didn't want to see anyone for a week, but you keep plodding along. 
Director James Cameron said that he had called Schwarzenegger the weekend after Last Action Hero opened and recalled that it was the only time he's ever seen him look down. He took it as a deep blow to his brand. I think it really shook him. Yeah. Uh, the film was nominated for six Golden Raspberry Awards. Uh, worst Picture, Worst Actor for Arnold Schwarzenegger, Worst Director, Worst Screenplay, Worst New Star for Austin O'Brien, and Worst Original Song, Big Gun by ACDC, but did not win any. I'm going to point out how abhorrent it is yeah. to nominate a child yeah. who did a great job, by the way. He was great in this movie. A child who had to carry this movie as the worst newcomer. F you. I mean, we were cruel back then. Yeah. yeah. There is that poor kid, man. You should never put this stuff on a kid. No. You don't no. really. I mean, no. the kid's not an adult. I don't care if he's in movies or he's a famous or whatever or even if he's a little dick it doesn't matter no, he's a he's child a kid. He's a kid. or she's a child uh the irony is that it was literally nominated at the saturn awards it was nominated in all the same categories as the golden raspberry awards but again didn't win any of those either Ow. Um, Ow. in the years since the release of last action hero the film has developed a strong cult following Schwarzenegger singled out that movie as his most underrated saying last action hero was great it wasn't fantastic it, but it was underrated. Now, more and more people are seeing it and saying, I love this movie. I'm getting the residual checks, so I know it's true. It made money. It, that's always an important thing for me. Because it's show business, right? Uh, later, Charles Dance said, I think they just didn't time the release very well. It came out more or less the same time as something very big. But it was fun to do. In October 2019, Schwarzenegger revealed that he was willing to star in True Lies 2 and Last Action Hero 2, possible legacy sequels to the two films of his 90s action roles. Uh, True Lies 2, no thanks. You don't need it. I don't no. think there's any reason to follow I that agree. up. This could be genius. Yeah. If they yeah. did a, a 2 and they got back Austin O'Brien, Austin O'Brien yeah. and they had him come back visiting... Yeah. Arnold, yeah. you know, in some like movie. Yeah, ticket again, and he's, yeah. And they go on some adventure, but you kind of juxtapose the old movies to the new movies. Yeah. And, and him mm-hmm. having to deal with all of the societal changes. And right. There's just so much fish out of water stuff. It yeah. could be brilliant. I agree. With, with the right agree. writer and director, it could be brilliant. Yeah. I mean, he wants to do it. I just, is at this point, I just don't know if, if Arnie still has the pull that he did. He doesn't. And that's a shame. I mean, this is what drives me nuts. I think that's so short-sighted. Uh... Because one, I'll tell you, is Axel F, the yeah, the yeah. movie on Netflix. It was really good, and it was the perfect mixture of new and fan service that was seamlessly built in and not like jammed in your face like right. the Star Wars movies. Right. <laughs> and it should have definitely been released. It would have boosted up the the box it's office, a cinematic release. Yeah, yeah, because it was the highest watched movie the most watched movie ever on netflix yeah yeah and a great fun movie for people that love beverly hills cop yeah it made up for three <laughs> <laughs> and they even like they're going th- the best part about it is is uh joseph gordon levitt's like ah you were here in 91 93 not your best work and then <laughs> but anyway it, it was done so well i think with the last action hero too, there are so many possibilities. Yeah, you put it in yeah. the hands of somebody like some people like Lord Miller. Yeah, yeah, that get get the meta side. Yes, yeah, that yeah. know how to make entertaining product. Yeah, that is unique and interesting, and and really like what they did with the Lego Movie was right. amazing. Right, you know, it's they get it. So in the, I think in the right hands, you could have you get Danny back, you get the actor yeah. back, yeah, and. You have him go, like, visit Jack, and it's like yeah, the last, yeah. you know, the, the movies have been failing, you know, yeah. the Arnold, you know, you, you play on Arnold's career not going well, him hanging out with the horse and donkey, right, right. you know, and it's like the last Jack Slater movie was just you know, straight to video or whatever, yeah, or straight yeah, to streaming, yeah. and he has to go and save the career, and, you know, maybe they go into another movie like, yeah. like you were talking about. With like a, 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 younger, a younger action star, a younger action star, yeah, that needs like, like help p- passing the torch, so to speak. Yeah, to yeah. like juice up his. It's like ah, oh, maybe if we go into his franchise, it'll help me and it'll help him. Right. I mean, it's right. just there's so much you can do there that would be so much fun. I would love, in the right hands, to see that. And I think Arnold now, he's been doing some really great work. Yeah, yeah, some really good small character pieces and good emotional work and I think he has the wisdom and the toolbox now to yeah, really yeah. give us 
a really well-rounded, amazing performance. I, I really want to see him do more like like Sean Connery did in the, in the 80s. Yes. Like more of those, those kind of like mentor roles. Yeah, yeah. And like, I, I, I think his ego is not going to let him do that. I don't know. But maybe. And I and I and this is my plea to Arnie, if you're ah, listening. Who's the mom now, <laughs> dog? Ow. Just do these roles. I mean, like, you don't have to be the lead. You know, I mean, you can still give in really great performances well, Fubar, in Titan movies. Fubar, he's not really the lead. Because it's the it's daughter. It's his daughter right? more. Yeah, yeah. You know, his daughter's CIA, and he's, you know, and then they figure out, oh, uh, we're both. We're, uh, we're know, both so secretly we lying to each other for yeah, years. Exactly. Secret lies. Uh, those lies are true lies. True lies. Well, that's um, not, we can't say that. It's copyrighted. But I, I think... I think he's up for it. I mean, he's done. He he did a kind of a can. His parts in the Expendables aren't that big. That's true. You know, he, that is true. I mean, he definitely and he's willing. Like the zombie movie, he's willing to do smaller projects. Yeah. And like, I did, I'm just curious to see where he goes. I love Arnie, and I really, I don't want his career to be over. Neither do I. And I think he also is a smart businessman. And yeah. I think he understands. Listening to him talk about his body, it's really sad because. He's like, you don't get it, you know? It's yeah, like yeah. watching when you were the perfect specimen that took so much work, you know? It wasn't like oh, it was yeah. just genetics. That no. mother effer, four or five times, four or five hours a day at least, uh, to go from that and then you're just, even at my age, I'm watching my body decompose and I'm, yeah, you know, 30 yeah. years younger than him and never in the shape that he was. But depression that gets to yeah, him because, yeah. you know, my flabby chest and you know, no matter how much I work, I can't, you know, get right, the body back. Right. I mean, look, the guy looks amazing for being in his yeah, 70s. Yeah, my God. Yeah. But I think he's a realist. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And he is self-aware. Yeah. I don't think he's self-delusional. And I think I think you get the right producer, the right directors, the people that are game for this, the right writers. Yes. 100%. Yes. 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 That want to do... For the 2020s, what this did for the 1990s, right, right, and it could be, it could be an absolute masterpiece if done yeah, correctly. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I, I, I hope that they figure it out. I mean, if he's game for it, then like I would hope that they would set some stuff up and and try to get it going. Well, what drives me crazy is guys like Sly and Harrison Ford and Arnold and to some extent Bruce Willis. These guys, uh, and Sigourney Weaver, and yeah. I'm not just saying it's just the dudes, but in the 80s and 90s, it was pretty much the dudes, let's yeah. be honest. Yeah. It's just the sexism of the time. But these people carried this industry. Right, right. Buoyed this industry and made so much, billions and billions and billions of dollars yeah. Yeah. for this industry. And then when they get to the point where they're not as viable or they're not as popular or there's not as economically sound, right. then they're just thrown off like garbage. And that yeah. dis- that's disgusting to me. There's very few people like Harrison Ford yeah. who can, up until his 80s, keep doing what he's doing. And even him, if you look at the response right. from the last indie movie, yeah. he doesn't have it as he did. No, no. You no. know, not everybody's like me. Right. <laughs> but I think... These guys deserve it, man. He deserves... Arnold deserves to do whatever he wants, and they should pay for it, and it shouldn't yeah. matter because yeah. the mother effer has earned it. Yeah. And all of you little effers out there that are working today would not have jobs if it were not for him or Sly or right. these big budget right. things. Call them soulless. Call them what you want. But there wouldn't be the Coen brothers, and there wouldn't be the money for all this other stuff if, if these big, right. crazy budget things hap- didn't happen. And let's be quite frank, they're fun. And yeah, they're, they're yeah. fun to watch. There is nothing wrong with watching a mindless action movie. No, no. Back in the, when this came out, I was a snoot, and I was more, you know, indie and, you know, yeah, frowning yeah. at the blockbusters and, oh, it's such a big bloated bleh. But as you get older, you appreciate things for what they are. Exactly. Not everything has to be everything. No, no. You know? Just get your popcorn, enjoy the movie, and be happy. If you're a movie lover, you love movies. Right. You know, right. if you're a snob or a snoot, then you just love your snoot movies. And that's fine. I'm not judging you. I guess I kind of am, but I'm not. <laughs> if you're a snob or a snoot, you're Gene Siskel. <laughs> but there's room for all these babies. And if, look, Howard the Duck, I would say watch it for, uh, for just the... The, uh, the weirdness of the whole yeah, thing? Yeah, Howard the Duck, watch that for the novelty of it. Yeah. You know, it was this big bomb, again... 
Not as big a bomb as everybody said. That's the no, thing about no, all of these, all movies, these movies this aren't. month. They, they still technically made money. Yes. Uh, but Howard the Duck, I would say watch that for for that reason. You know, to see a young Tim Robbins do a horrible performance. There's there's enough in there to watch to enjoy. Hudson Hawk, I'd just say skip it. Yeah, you it's, know? It's, it's highly disappointing. It's not good. I, we've had a few people comment that, that they love this movie. And, of course, there's nostalgia sheen sure. for people. It's but, still not good. <laughs> not we the, for the first time we're pretty much telling you not to watch yeah, something don't, that we've don't, covered. Don't watch it. But Last Action Hero, if you haven't seen it in a while, yeah. if you haven't seen it, if you heard like, oh, it's stupid, watch it, man. You're gonna love it. If you love movies, you're gonna love it. If you love Arnold, you're gonna love it. Yeah, I think it makes more sense to watch it now. I, that's, I think that's how far ahead of its time it was. You can look at it back now, like you were saying, mm-hmm. it's a time capsule of that time. And it's an, it was amazing. It was It's a fun movie. It's a super fun movie. I love movies. I love a movie about movies. Yeah, me too. So this, is, this was just hitting on all cylinders, yeah. and I loved it. it I, I agree with you. I agree with you. I was going to say 100%, but I'm trying to stop <laughs> saying that. But I agree with you wholeheartedly. Yes. And you're so right, man. This movie is so much more effective now because it is... Like the perfect little time capsule. Yeah. You don't even even watch any other eighties no, or nineties no, action no, movies really to understand don't. the genre. Yeah. Yeah. And they really poked fun at it. They poked fun at it too well because I think people took seriously the things that weren't supposed to be right, serious and didn't right. take serious the things that were. Yeah. And again, I believe this was a victim of the studios, bad timing. Yeah. And and the executives killed this movie. Oh, the executives. Oh, totally. Because the creative team was 100% firing, like you said, on all cylinders. Yeah, yeah. And it is a very underrated movie. And uh, I would say one of Arnold's best. I, I would agree. I would agree. I love this movie so much. Yeah. So we saved the best bomb for last, people. <laughs> and uh, and this, yeah. If you're going to watch anything this month, watch this one. Yeah. We'll be back next week. We're going to do our stepdad show, talk more about some bombs. And... Oh, make a few corrections. Yeah. And I we'll have some corrections to make. I'm an idiot. <laughs> I'm an idiot. I'm, I'm an idiot. All right. Well, thanks for listening. Yeah. And, uh, you know. Oh. Danny. Welcome to the Gen X Files. I'm Jim. I'm Adam. And today's show is all about last the last action here. Oh, it's just here. last just action here. Last action here, yeah. Right, sorry. <laughs> Take two. And then it was whipped and unedited. Whipped, whipped out unedited. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Ouch. Poop myself in the eye. Uh, where was I? And then, and then it was. We now return you to your regularly scheduled programming, The Partridge Family, already in progress.